Welcome everyone and uh, to our parenting discussion at our 2018 um, Anasazi Gala. This is our 30 year anniversary, believe it or not. And uh, I was actually recruited by Terry Warner to get involved with Anasazi back in 1990. And I had a little more hair back then. But um, we, um, Terry got us, and myself and Sterling Tanner involved early on um, with Anasazi and we were quickly captivated by this man and his work as he mentored us and worked with us in those early years. But I'll never forget Terry Warner saying to us that um, the reason he brought us on and others to help Anasazi move forward was that he wanted to make sure Anasazi was around for many, many years to come. And I'll never forget him saying, I remember at one point saying, at least 25, we're gonna make sure Anasazi run for at least 25 years. And guess what? We're still here, um, thanks to Terry and, and many others who have lend their support to us. So we thought we'd start off with just a simple question. Have Terry, if you would be willing to share with us a little bit about how you became acquainted with Anasazi, um, that would be kind of fun for everybody to hear. Well, I had given a talk somewhere, I think in Utah, <clears throat> and at the end of it, some people came up to talk and two um, slightly rough looking individuals kind of waited till the end, came up and they were Larry Olson and Zeke Sanchez. And they told me what they were doing and they asked if I could help them. And uh, for some reason, and I, I, I thought what they were, had in mind was very good. They'd already accomplished a few things. This was 1989. Yeah. And, uh, so I began coming south and to Payson, Arizona at that time. And uh, we did some planning and training and the Arbinger Institute got involved in, uh, for the parents. And one thing, one good thing led to another. And uh, I think it was very robust in those days uh, because Everybody in, a, in a, small or, a small organization is an interesting phenomenon because everyone has to do everything or they have to be so deeply aware of what everything that's going on that they can adapt themselves to uh, the total complex process, whatever it is. When an organization gets past a certain size, it has to start departmentalizing and setting up process rules of various kinds, and that's when a lot of challenges begin. But in those early days, everyone was doing everything, and, uh, and it showed good results right from the beginning. So if I remember the story correctly, you actually came down, after you met Larry Zagil, you actually came down, went on the trail for Thanksgiving, um, brought family members down with you, and um, I remember you know, you sharing that, look, there was something about, you saw something at Anasazi and the work that they were doing, what learning people had put together that, that really interests you, fascinated you in some ways. Well, uh, the core of the Anasazi experience, especially then for a reason that could no longer, could not persist, was that individuals grew in direct proportion uh, to the their willingness to take responsibility for themselves. And that's absolutely critical. Uh, human beings, for some reason, will go to almost any length to dodge responsibility, but uh, because that means um, you're, either at f you're either at fault or other people think you're at fault. You thought it was gonna say, or you get the credit. No, <laughs> other people think you're at fault. And uh, so, it takes a lot of courage and experience to realize that my destiny is really in my hands. Uh, God will help me. And that help is necessary, but it isn't sufficient. It takes everything <coughs> that I have, and he's already willing to give everything that he has, and then it can work. But it's that discovery so I had a half a dozen children who, uh, my wife and I have half a dozen children. Excuse me, Susan, that was not intentional. Um, 
I didn't have any of them, as a matter of fact, uh, who, who went on the trail or worked on the trail and uh, maybe more. And it shows to this, this day in their lives. Some of them wanted to make it a profession for a while. Anyway, I won't go into all that. They had uh, John and Danny, Johan and yeah. Danny. They were kind of uh, Western heroes, I think, for a while. They were in our eyes. Anyway, that's the story. Well, shortly after, um, <coughs> shortly after Terry got involved with Anasazi, um, Cheryl Olson, one of uh, uh, Larry Olson's wife, who at that time was actually our, uh, working with all of our parents when children came in the program. She brought to me some papers. She said, I'd like to have you read a little bit. Have you ever read any of Terry's work? Well, I've been working with Terry, but I've never read any of his papers or any of his work. She gave them to me, and they were like super dense. I mean, I could, I could just, I could hardly get through them. Um, and then um, <laughs> there was Terry Olson came to do a, an education week, I think, in Phoenix. And I went to attend it. And, and he was sharing with us Terry Warner's ideas and uh, um, around the Arbinger work. And I immediately, this is what our parents need in Anasazi. And so we, we started, we, we started doing Arbinger sessions. Um, Terry brought people down um, up in Payson. We did it, or we, we did it at, a, um, at the school offices there in Payson, Arizona. And then we uh, began doing them at an Italian restaurant there. So we had a lot of fun with those sessions. And I remember early on, Terry came down and was spending some time with us, and we were asking him questions around all of this. And Gaylene asked this question. My wife asked this question. I'd love to start with that question this evening. That is, we had a couple of siblings, or, little, or children at that time, a couple of our children at that time, that were fighting with each other pretty regularly. And uh, their, their hearts were certainly at war with one another. And so, so Terry, thinking about um, you know, children who are at war with one another, um, any thoughts you might have about it, how to be helpful to that, how, how to help in a situation like that? Well, first of all, I, I, I would really like to comment on, on um, your, your desire to have the parents have an experience while the children are on the trail. Um, a family is a, an, an organism. Uh, it's a, it's a small community, each member of which is responding to every other member at all times. So they are as one, even if they're fighting. And uh, there's no way to isolate the experience or the growth or the troubles of one individual from everybody else. So you and I know that if a child has a kind of rehabilitative experience of some kind and, and sees an open trail in front of her or him and is excited about life and willing to do whatever it takes and goes back to the old dysfunctional family, the dream doesn't last very long. So the whole family has to change together or it doesn't work. And so that became a core element of the Anasazi experience, that the parents would become responsible for themselves so that the children could maintain responsibility for themselves. That was critically important. So the whole concept uh, that has driven some, um, uh, uh, teenager rehabilitation programs um, that moved a lot of well-endowed parents to send their children to some rehabilitative center or to the wilderness. Uh, here's money, you fix them. But that is intrinsically impossible. That's just a dodge of responsibility on everybody's part. So. Uh, I felt like that was core. That was the important element. Now, uh, 
Before you answer the next question, I totally agree. It's been core. It's been the key to everything we do at Anasazi is the, the family. And so the Arbinger piece has been, has been hugely important to that work. And I do want to say something about the dense papers. They're no longer dense to me now. They were, they were at the time. I didn't have a clue about what, what he was trying to say in the beginning, but, but I do now. And, uh, and, and, and this work has been um, invaluable. And how many of us in this room have been impacted by that <laughs> work, right? So they are very much uh, touched that and has impacted their lives. And so, anyway, back to the question. Well, before we do any question, I'd just like to put you on notice, if I may. Uh, before we're done, I would like to hear from as many of you as possible what treasures of understanding you have come through in trying to live in your family better. And um, had an experience a few weeks ago uh, giving an hour to people in a group from all over the world uh, over the telephone. So I sat in my study and they were everywhere. And this one person said, I pondered what I've learned over many years and I have, um, I boiled it down to three questions that I ask myself, always ask myself now when I get into a misunderstanding or I see that there's a problem of any kind, one is, what have I received from this person? What have I given to this person? What trouble have I been for this person? Now, that's a formulation that never occurred to me, but what I have learned over and over again is that if we're on the right track in our search for understanding and sharing and teaching, then other people will almost instantly make it, if, if they look at their own lives and, and, and actually walk that trail as it were, if they make the turn around and examine themselves and decide they're going forward differently, they make what they've learned so much their own that they'll use a different vocabulary, that they'll formulate it differently, but it will be theirs, not but, and therefore it will be theirs. And that's so much better than somebody becoming a quote convert or a, a follower or a, a, a fan of any kind. And they would say, oh, now what did so-and-so say about what you should do in this situation? It's irrelevant. You become a center of understanding and, and, and sensitivity and inspiration. Uh, and you're the only one who, who is so invested in the situation that you can see it honestly for what it is. Generic rules for human behavior are starting points at best and usually very misleading. You, you make it your own, it becomes you. And uh, right off the bat, and nobody else has done this. Nobody's responsible for it. So I just, I want to emphasize that. It's really important. That's why I want it. I said, I'd love to hear your treasures of understanding that you may have come to that seem important to you. Because sharing some of those can enrich everybody. Now, you ask a question, Gaylene, his wife asked a question. She has two fighting children. And what do you do about ending the war. And I, I would really love to know what I said because I, uh, I would uh, probably walk in into a trap. But l let me share a thought. Here, so, well, you can say whatever you'd like to say. Uh, uh, let me share a thought. Yeah, but you recorded it. Uh, in trouble already. Uh, but let me share a thought about that. What are the children seeking to get out of their quarreling? What, 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 what are they seeking to get from it? Because first of all, we want to understand why it's going on. So what do you think they're 
they're wanting. I have a nephew and niece. They were about seven and, well, maybe six and eight. And every night, they went moving into a new house and their bedrooms were downstairs, the parents were upstairs. And so every night they would get into a big hassle, every night about it. And um, uh, so we were all sitting around the table talking about one night and their mother was describing the horrors of the situation. And um, the little girl said, uh, uh, well, I'm the fight starter. And the little boy said, and I'm the go up teller. <laughs> so they knew pretty well what was going on. I'm the go up teller. So they knew what was going on. And why, why would children do that? Every night. And then the parents come storming down and trying to straighten things out issuing ultimata and if you do this, we're not going to the movies on Saturday night. Well, you knew darn well we were going to the movies on Saturday night, but why? Well, isn't part of it that that's how you get the parents' attention? That's how you get them involved in your life. And it's also how you escape responsibility for this way of getting attention. Because if Coco, who's the girl, um, is wrong, then David can't be wrong. He's only telling mom and dad. But talk about aggravating. You have somebody go and tattle on you every time you do anything. And so that starts a fight right away. This brings us to a different, uh, <coughs> another uh, dimension that I, I would very much like to talk about a little bit. Hope I can do with this. Every community, every organization, every group of people who work or live together um, has either by intent or else simply by human need developed uh, a system, um, a tacit set of policies or ways of doing things or a group of rules. And, um, and without this, without this structure of practice, this institutional structure, it's often, it's seldom mentioned, but it's there. How do you make yourself clear to people? Uh, who's responsible for the meals? Uh, when you, are you supposed to show up? Um, uh, what's, doesn't count, what counts as crossing the line uh, with other people and so on? Without this structure, uh, it would be impossible to for people to relate to one another on a consistent basis. We have expectations of one another. It's not said, but it's there. It's there as much as the common language is there. In fact, it's very much like a language. In addition, <clears throat> you have to give life to this structure. The structure itself doesn't do anything, but it's very securing. We have a son <coughs> who has loved animals since he was a little boy, and he loved the trail, and he's, he, he's uh, he spent years working in Africa with baboons and other animals. Uh, he just knows how to connect with animals and teach them. He, they may have had today their fourth baby. They have three little boys. And uh, <laughs> these are among the happiest children I've ever encountered. But unlike some of the other families, uh, there's never any pushing or threatening or st stop that or you're going to get a whap in the face or anything like that. It's just quiet expectation that this is the way we do things. 
when children, if, if you observe, when children are at a very young age, and they begin to become aware of their parents, they want to be like their parents. They want to imitate them. They want, they, they idolize them. And it may not last very long, uh, but there are, there's a time when the example of the parents has a powerful influence. And if the parents are examples of living according to the boundaries, not, not just saying what they are, but living according to them, then that's accepted as the, as the way of doing things in our family. And it's, it's extraordinarily powerful. Not every child is necessarily going to, to take it up. We, it, it's too difficult to track you know, what might have gone wrong in an individual case. It might have been in the neighborhood or whatever. But that's a good starting point. Most of us are here, including Susan and me, because it didn't go perfectly for every child in the family. That some had abusive experiences growing up or felt like they were pushed out of their role in the family or something. But most of our work at our age, if we're starting at age 20 to 25 and beyond, most of it is is reconstructive and, and corrective and trying to find a way to establish a relationship that will, in, in which our children who have been struggling may find themselves secure and able to respond with their best selves to life. But I just want to, to say that it doesn't matter if we're in an organization, uh, Politi a political or governmental one or a business organization or a creative organization of some kind or a family or a church. We have to bring the policies, the protocols, the systems to life. And we can either do that in a destructive way or a very constructive way. There's a guy, there's a, uh, a group from Harvard. Uh, I think the leader is named Robert Keegan. And, uh, they, they use a term for the way they work with organizations. They like to nurture an organization until it becomes a deliberately developmental organization. Those words are extremely communicative. A deliberately developmental organization. We're here not just to do a job and go home and respond to people negatively if people mistreat us or respond positively if we get a raise or something. We're here to develop ourselves and the organization, the way we do things. A great organization not only has policies and, and processes, there have to be there, but constantly the people in that organization are refining and developing the way they do things. And the best way to do that, the Arbinger Group calls this, uh, with, is with an outward mindset, thinking about how I do my job in such a way that it helps other people do their job better. Because I impact on other people if I'm in an organization with them. Well now if I'm going to refine the process, let me refine it by taking to, into account the people's needs that I impact. Does my work hinder them or does it help them? Does it advance or Im impede or inhibit the work? Same thing is true in a family. People who, there's something about people who care, who are really adapting themselves to facilitate other people's success. Not doing the work for them, not taking over, not telling them everything to do, but giving them the opportunity and believing in them. And then, and then what they do will, will be developmental. The issue here that I'm talking about is the issue of making a marriage and a family intentional, not just accidental, not just scrambling through all the time, but rather deliberately pondering and planning what we can do to help the other person develop. I have a friend who was a very noted middle school teacher. He obviously 
made very little money, not enough to ever have two cars in the family. They had to take care of their car very carefully. But this friend of mine was extremely thoughtful about the development of his children. His son became six, his oldest son became 16 and said that he wanted to be able to drive the car. He had in mind some dates and maybe some events that he would like a privilege of driving to. And my friend said, you could drive that car. He said, of course, you need to drive it with the same responsibility that I have. If the car breaks down, I have to fix it. If it runs out of gas, I have to put gas in the car. If the tires wear out, we have to replace the tires. So you can run it just like an adult would. You can use that car when you need it. And of course, I expect you to be just, to use it in just the way I do. If it runs out of gas, you fill it. Or if you know you're going to use gas, you put gas in it. That's what I have to do. Well, this boy, 16 years old, regular all-American kid, decides that when he uses the car, he's gonna be very careful. And when he rides with his mother, he says, mother, don't speed up and then slam on the brakes at the stoplight, just coast down because it wears out the tires. He was the one that became the most conscientious about preserving that car because he knew there wasn't gonna be any other car. That was it. And there's something magnificent about children growing up with a sense of, res of shared responsibility for what's going to happen in the family. Now, what you do after they declare war on one another is a real challenge. And I think that uh, the example of a parent's repentance goes a long, long way. And you have to, uh, you, you, I'm kind of running off at the mouth, but you, you have to, you have to school yourself not to berate them or not to talk down to them or not to remind them over and over and over and over again what they're supposed to be doing. They know already, they know. But if you're in their face all the time, they've got, they've got a distraction to deal with. They've got to put up with this. They've got, they would like to take responsibility, but if you're taking responsibility for them, it's really hard to grow up. Awesome, and I've got, my phone's blown up, so here's some of the questions for you, okay, as you're talking. So this one says, Terry has written that we should not control our children, our children, be, because they rebel, but, but we should let the natural consequences come out. How do we balance that with the need to have some boundaries, like curfews, drugs, school, etc.? cetera? When, the, when youth break these boundaries, seems like you need consequences, which is, to some extent, controlling. Good question, what do you think? Please. You're right, man, you stay there. <clears throat> we had kind of, my husband and I have been going back and forth with this ourselves. Um, our daughter is 17 and a half, and we've been wrestling with the whole notion of, well, she's going to be an adult pretty soon. And I'm saying, oh, but emotionally, she's really like a 14-year-old because we coddled her when she got sick. And we uh, did everything for her. And now she can't think for herself. She can't do anything for herself. Um, so we were back and forth. And, and how, how do we now get her to stand on her own two feet and understand that there are parameters? And so as we were kind of investigating this a little bit more, we started finding that we can't infringe upon her agency. She's got a God-given agency, and the wisest parent ever, which is God, gave us all agency with no rules. <laughs> there, are, there are some things that he said, hey, if you want some blessings, got to do this. So what we found, and we're still learning how to put this into practice, but we found that we can't control what she does, and she has to know that she has the agency to choose. But we can control what we offer. If we offer a car, it will be what we offer, and there will be provisions for that. Um, you have to keep it up. You have to put gas in it, just like you had said, have the same responsibility as we do. 
And also, same thing with the cell phone. I feel that if we supply and pay for that, that cell phone, that we do have some things that we can say we provide and we're willing to provide this. You can still break the rules and do this and this and this, but we have our parameters that we will react in, I guess is what we're thinking. Okay. So Terry, in response to that, any thoughts? Yeah, we're getting into really interesting territory. Uh, I'm not sure there's always a lot of ru rules t for, the, for parents to follow here, but there, there is a sensibility about the whole thing. Um, I, I'm going to try to do this. There are some parts of this where it makes perfectly good sense to say, uh, in our family, one of us doesn't stay out late and cause the rest of the family to worry. I don't know your name, but suppose you're Ralph. Ralph doesn't do that to me, and I don't do it to him. We're always in touch with one another. We care about one another so much that we can't have peaceful hearts if we don't know that the other one is okay. And we expect that of everybody in the family. It's not unreasonable. And so you have the same responsibility because just because we love you as we have to each other and we've always tried to exemplify this. We know some of your friends do otherwise and that's, that's up to them. But we also know that we can help one another and we can grow together better if we respect the care and love we have for each other. And that's what we're asking of you. You kind of re-describe it, recontextualize it. And it's a very powerful thing to do. If you you re-describe it as the truth, not as, not as an issue between you, but the practices of our family that can make us all successful together. I uh, had an interesting experience not long ago. Uh, we're Latter-day Saints and we, <laughs> we, um, we, we go to Sunday, church and Sunday school every Sunday and we've had a family relations class. And I, I like to go to another class, but this one, I, I just felt like I ought to go this particular day. So here I am, I go into this class, and they're in the middle of this most bizarre discussion. <coughs> uh, and the example given by the teacher was, <coughs> okay, you put $10 in this drawer, this, your parent, and you put it there because you need to take it. And um, you go to the drawer and it's missing. And so you confront your children. And suppose the child is Jake, and so you come up here, so-and-so, and you be Jake, and you come up here, so-and-so, and you be the father, and what are you going to say to Jake? And so we saw about three iterations of this, and it was uh, the threat of punishment, and you've done the wrong thing, and, uh, and you need to do this and that. And it's all pretty confrontational and directive, and... And, 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 fi and finally, I knew why I was there. I said, may I get, give a try, have a try at this? And so I went up and, and I just felt it so much because I guess of our children. And I just said to this fellow who was, rep who was acting the part of Jake, I said, look, the $10 doesn't matter that much. It's not important to me. But what matters is that you grow up to be a fine, honorable young man. Oh, incidentally, with all the other cases, Jake would say, no, I didn't take it, I don't take it. Maybe Susie did, but I didn't. And I said, what matters to me is that you grow up to be a fine, honorable young man. A man who has great influence and who is happy in his life and can spread happiness and be a wonderful father. You can do that. And that's why I'm asking you now to Respond with your integrity. Did you take this, Jake? And if you did, m my concern is just that 
share it with me. And my concern is not the ten dollars. I just want, I just love you, and I care about you. I can't remember all that I said, but I really felt it, and uh, it just changed everything, because everybody knows that that's right. That it isn't all of a sudden you're, you're, you're dealing with an enemy. It's that you're dealing with somebody you'd give your life for. So how do you, how do you talk to them? You talk to them from your heart. And it might be different for each one of us with each, and it might be different with each one of our children. But it's going to be open and honest and it's going to matter to the child if you yourself have been exemplifying these kinds of things the best you can in your own life. Does that make sense? Great. We've got a question here about, about connection. And so as busy as people are in today's lives, um, and I'd love to hear Terry elaborate on the importance of connection. Have you ever heard of the magazine, the journal, First Things, it's a, it's a journal of religious people. It was started by a Roman Catholic, but Jews and Protestants write in it, and occasionally a Latter-day Saint, and, uh, uh, and occasionally uh, a Muslim. But so, so what they're concerned about is that the issues that matter to religious people can be voiced in the public square. It's a, there's quite a few institutions that are concerned about r religious freedom, freedom of living your, to live your religion and express it. Well, in the most recent one, there's an interesting article called uh, re something like rescuing the household or something like that. A household and a family are two different things. It used to be in this country because of the economy that people lived in households. They, not only, they didn't just come home at night and go to the refrigerator individu individually and get something to eat and then look at their screens, big or little, and then go to bed and then go back in, to work in the morning or back to school. They had a household and they lived together and they depended upon one another and that relationship, that household, was critically important to the deliberate development of every individual in it. And we're losing that. We've lost it in many places and cases. So your point uh, seems to me to be, uh, to have a great deal to do with that, that uh, we have to learn how, we have to fight all of the pressures to go our disparate ways and to, and to turn over to the rest of the world the modeling, the influence on, and the education of our children. That's ours to do. So we've got to gather it all back in. And we've got to say, doesn't matter what sacrifice we have to make, the time I've spent with the boys or the time I've spent with the women out in, in every Thursday having a book club or lunch or whatever. No, this is why I'm here. My whole heart is given to this household and we do things together and we depend on each other and we've got to teach our children these ways. There's something really powerful about that, it seems to me. Otherwise, the family isn't, it, it isn't a genuine institution in which people can find refuge, peace, understanding, and every, all of that sort of thing. The, 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 the core of human life, it can't be separated from a, from a primary group. And the primary group has been, it, it's, a dic, it's a dictum of creation itself that it's in a family. And a lot of people had a cruddy family life. And for the last 60 years or more, there are people all over the world who got a little education and who thinks that the problem is the family. So let's destroy the family. Or the problem is the patriarch, the, the, the supposed father who's been abusive. Let's get rid of the patriarchy. Let's, let's make an institutional change. Well, 
I don't care what you do institutionally, it's never going to be the answer. The answer is always going to come one-on-one -on -one or one-to-many where people are living together and learning to be together, to work together, to be themselves. But we've lost even the meaning of life because we've destroyed family and we've destroyed our religious core. And the family and religion for centuries, uh, not only in the Christian tradition, but in many other traditions have been so closely tied to one another that they, they couldn't, be, couldn't be pried apart. Well, that gives meaning to life and people know that who they are. You, you aren't somebody apart from everybody else. And if, you're, if you live and, and draw your sustenance from people whose only reality is on a screen somewhere, you don't know who you are. You don't have any idea. Who you are can disappear. Somebody can defriend you or something like that. <laughs> Unf unfriend you. Okay. Just like that. And then where are you? You're so you might as well take your life. It's a real phenomenon and it's terrible. But what we're talking about now is a crux. It's the very source of, of our sense of the meaning of life and why we exist. And you destroy that for all kinds of reasons and they all have some kind of an economic or sociological root. But they think, people think they're making things better when they're only gumming it up so much it may be, the destruction may be irretrievable. Some woman said to her daughters, <coughs> no, to her children, she had a son too. She said, you can wear anything you want when you leave this house. But if I don't like it, if, if ever I say I don't like it, then you have to take it off. You have to change your clothes. But otherwise you can do anything you want. Well, the kids thought that was a great deal. But the interesting thing is, she said, I, I think I've got these numbers right. With two of her girls, it only happened one time. And with another one, it happened two or three times. And with a, uh, the boy, the fourth one, three or four times. And, and all are growing up because they accepted the deal. I mean, it's, that's a little crass way to say it, but we're playing fair here. <coughs> So they anticipate, the, the child has to be able to anticipate, not just play, roll the dice and see if the consequences are gonna come down hard. Now somebody asked about consequences, about control. Yeah, we, all right, let, let's just talk about that for a minute. Oh yes, that's when we got off on, on, having, a, on having a structure. Uh, tribes have structures, uh, groups of animals have a structure and they don't violate that. And, and the only ones that go rogue, the only animals that usually go rogue in an animal pride or uh, clan or group of any kind are, the, are usually the males who don't have a mate, who aren't any longer part of a family. And some, and some animals we know are, have no, are, are, are isolated and they, they don't, they don't live in families, but an awful lot of them live in communities and depend upon one another, and there are ways of doing things, and they grow as a community as a result. I don't know how far you can extend that analogy, but with human beings, these children, these little children that are born into the world, they have such endless potential. If only we can learn to enable them to develop themselves through the experiences that we nurture. And it means order and discipline as necessary essential dimensions. But on top of that, there is the freedom and choice and creativity and imagination and development and doing things their own way and their own hook. So, there is that for which, that 
which is for the sake of the family, because we all depend on it, and there's that which is for the sake of the individual. And it seems to me that we do not, it seems to me, and this is not all that profound, but that we can't apologize for asking everyone in the family and being the first to step up to it as parents to do some of what we do, what is necessary for the sake of this family, being together, blessing one another, having an orderliness and a peace that is critically important. And we all make that choice to be part of this family. Uh, this business, some people think that, okay, you're not supposed to control your children, so they just grow up wild. That's inane. I, I can remember, I was 19 years old, I was in England, and uh, I met a guy who was one of the most off-putting people that I had met up to that point in my life. And he said he wasn't going to expect anything of his son or teach him uh, his uh, religion or his personal philosophy of life. He would wait and let him till, uh, wait till he got to 20 years old and let him choose for himself. Well, in the meantime, the kid has been nurtured and taught by all the people around him. He's become one of them, not one of you. It's going to happen. The child is going to be formed in response to the experiences that he or she is primarily uh, uh, given. And that's going to either be out of your hands or it's going to be in the confines of a family that does those things, not just talks those things, right? And I, I believe we can do that. I have a friend, Perry Brott is his name. He's really quite an extraordinary human being. And, and every, since his family began, every once a month, they pick out a family that they know to go do a service project with. Help them with their landscape or help them clean up the garage or something. They're always doing that. And they've had a profound experience on other people. And one of their sons has grown up to be kind of a mountain man and slightly irresponsible. The others are just straight arrow citizens, but, but even even the one who's uh, the mountain man. He's got a family and he's doing his best. It's just amazing what belonging to a family that feels a mission, that has some ideals, it's amazing what can happen to people if they're part of that. Uh, not just a passive part, but a contributing part, an important part. And I, I believe with all my heart that it's possible. I also believe that it's difficult and that the world is going to try to get in the way of us. But I think we can do that. The really difficult part is to, is to correct it later on. But the experience that Susan and I have had is that we've often thought, we knew just what to tell them to get to straighten up. And the best thing we did was to not, not do that, but just to continue to love them so that they would find more acceptance, care, love, and support with us than they could possibly find anywhere else. And they find their way back. Does that make sense? So, I'm getting all I wanted. But. No, I'm not. <laughs> you keep wondering. So this question. How do you change a heart of war to peace when you literally don't feel it due to violated behavior from your child? Have you ever encountered uh, the work of Jordan Peterson? Jordan Peterson is a phenomenon. He's a Canadian, studied at Harvard. He's a psychologist at the University of Toronto. And he started uh, to answer some of people's relational relationship and psychological questions on Quora and he found uh, this is a uh, an app where people put in their questions anybody wants can answer and he found that he got so many 
hundreds of thousands of responses that all of a sudden he became a celebrity. And then Justin Trudeau said, we're going to pass a law in Canada that you have to use these certain substitute words for pronouns that are, that are uh, gender, gender neutral. And Jordan Peterson, who's, who's really well educated and he's really bright, but he's also just filled with common sense. He thought this was the stupidest thing he ever heard and he took on Justin Trudeau and pretty soon he became a Canadian hero. Anyway, he wrote a book called 12 Rules for Life and it's very interesting. You don't have to swallow it all, but, but he'll, he'll give examples of people that he's working with in his, in his uh, psycho, psychotherapy uh, practice. But he says one of his rules is something like this. Never do anything to your children that will cause you to hate them. It's a very interesting formulation. Never alienate them so much that they will become the bane in your existence. And what does it take? It takes whatever it takes. And it may, and, and, I, and I, I believe with all my heart that it, it takes mining whatever it is inside of ourselves whether it is a change that we have to make, whether it is extended effort that we have to make, it's not how much we can indulge that child. Love is an indulgent. Love expects things. Love, uh, indulgent says, you're not competent to do this, so I have to cut you a lot of slack. No, the expectations don't go away. But the love is magnified and the care is genuine. It's not sappy, it's not treacle, it's not uh, overdone, it's just there, but it's, wh it's whatever it takes. And I, 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 I really believe that whether it's in an organization or in a family or in a community, to reach a person usually takes sacrifice on the part of somebody. Because that person is looking for everything the person who's disgruntled or alienated or wandering or lost or discouraged or despairing, they're looking for everything. And that doesn't mean they're looking for everything from everybody. They're looking for something that's genuine and reliable and true and meaningful and important. And they can find it in us if we care about enough about it. And we're generally not, generally not, we're not at liberty if we belong to a family to give all of ourselves apart from our family. So maybe that means that where we give all of ourselves is right in our family. Sometimes we do. We just pull out all the stops and help somebody outside of our family and that's important. It's better to take our family with us and get us all engaged. But that person who's lost is looking for something monumentally important that will fill them. And only love can do that. Here's a deeper question. Is love an outward stimulus or an emotional response we choose? You mean, is it a reaction to outward stimulus or an emotional response we choose? Well, it's not a reaction to out, an outward stimulus, or we'd all be stimulated out of our minds because we've all got plenty of opportunity. So is it an emotional response we choose? Well, we have a very smart neighbor <coughs> who once responded to somebody who said, love is a choice. She said, love is, yeah, love is a choice like remodeling our house was a choice. We make the choice and then we go to work. It's a, that's why love is a choice. And maybe that's one of the best things that could ever be said about it. It's not just, oh, I choose, not like I choose chocolate rather than vanilla. All that can be inaugurated and completed in 30 seconds or less. Unless you're like me and I can't make a choice, it takes two minutes to make that choice. But no, this is a kind of choice where you embark. It's a choice to embark. 
And I believe that you have to find your way. You have to find a way. And a lot of times it just takes cleaning out the storeroom of our own, which is full of worthless things, by the way, of our own psyche until we can be filled up with concerns about what really matters. Because if you're like me, some of the things you devote yourself to day after day are pretty habitual. And distractions are very attractive and time-wasting. And often you just don't feel like it because you've got, I mean, you, some of you have only 50 years of habits or 35 years of habits. I got 82 years of habits. That's a big mountain. But you've got to keep trying all the time. Susan is great for me because she's always thinking about things we can do for other people. She's kind of neurotic that way. I mean, she never stops thinking about things we can do for other people. So I get engaged in doing things for other people too. And our best conversations are usually along those lines about our kids and our grandkids and what we can do. It really has an awful lot to do with uh, examining ourselves and deciding, hey, I haven't been living in the real world the important world. I'm being confessional, but that's how it is for me. We have a question around, um, it says, in terms of percentages, where would you place nature versus nurture in a child? Uh, it's a bogus question, isn't it? <coughs> because you're nurturing nature. So to quantify that and assign percentages seems to me to be, it's the nature, <coughs> Jerome, <coughs> Jerome, what's his last name? A great psychologist. I'm getting so old I forget my best friend's names. Uh, Jerome starts with a V. Anyway, he did some research many years ago, I'm going to say 65 years ago, on three-month-old children. And at that age, they're generous. They want to share what they have. And then they learn that we better protect it because somebody else is going to run off with it, maybe a big brother or sister. So then they don't do that anymore. But <clears throat> I think our natures, our instincts, our responses look into the eyes of a three-year-old child. We, we made uh, copies of a, of a photo of one of our boys just a few weeks ago. Remember in the red coat, Susan? And I looked at his face, and uh, he's had some challenges in his life, but it was so intelligent and pure and open and responsive and excited. So that, that's what you're working with. And then you got, you got the drag of all kinds of people around you teaching them something else. I mean, some beautiful little boy was sitting across the aisle from me on the plane watching some action hero movie where people are pounding the daylights out of each other. What in the world is going on? Why? It's not how it's supposed to be. But if that child is, is fed the food of caring from an early age, he or she will stay steady. The, the, <coughs> we have 10 children. The family that's having the greatest challenges now uh, had purchased a home. And uh, it's in California, it costs a lot of money. But it's turned out that the people defrauded them. And this home is a mess. The sewage system went out last week. They've been 
five days since the last uh, most recent report I had without water, without sewage. They've been living over at grandpa and grandma's house. And, uh, <clears throat> but these kids have grown up helping out with this problem. They're refinishing the kitchen. They're scraping down cabinets. They're just doing all kinds, removing things. And they're all pitched in and working. They come home and they're the loveliest children you ever, you ever met. I start to tear up when I think about them, every one of them. And yet they have, they've shared the responsibility of that household. And this father was offered a job. He is, he is uh, one of the few in the country who is an expert in his field. And he was offered, he's been offered various jobs and he, they take him away from the family and he was offered one recently, they had to move. It was an exorbitant amount of money, but he stayed where he is for his family because they're this team, you know, and every child feels the same way. And they learned seven years ago that they were having twins and the twins were sharing one placenta and the diagnosis, the prognosis was <coughs> that the oldest of the twins would die and the youngest of the twins would be impaired because all the blood flow has to go through the one child, the first child, to the second child. The first child gets too much blood to the brain and the second child doesn't get enough. And they thought, this is a disaster. And, uh, and, and it, the prognosis was terrible. But these children were born so beautiful with their arms around each other that just after they came out, they just put their arms back around each other. That's how they were in the womb. <coughs> and, uh, and these older children have learned how to take care of these kids. And the two younger children did not learn to talk. When the youngest one got to be about five, he started to talk and he made some advances. They're now seven years old. And uh, the oldest one, he hasn't talked at all. He said some words, but the other day his mother called and she said, um, oh, he said, seven years old, he's never said a sentence before. He said, mommy, I got a rock in my eye. And uh, whole family, is on the moon. <laughs> and uh, when she was putting him into bed, they, they worked on that. When she put him into bed, he said, Mommy, have you ever got a rock in your eye? I mean, $10 million would not have moved that family. So then he says, a little bit later, when he's just going to sleep, he said, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Mommy, did you know we're not supposed to say Jesus too much? So we think it may happen, you know. But you can imagine the investment. These little boys are perfectly formed and they're rambunctious and they're wild and they, I mean, they just climb everything and they run over everything. So somebody has to watch them all the time. So all the family has shared this. It, uh, no family could have been more blessed than this family was with this because they all have sacrificed a great deal for these two little boys. And so when they say that, when the Anders said his first sentences, there's nothing like it, nothing. Um, question from the audience. Um, this one says, this is kind of fun. How does Terry keep himself looking so young? <laughs> What's the secret, Terry? <laughs> you need cataracts. <laughs> I don't know. I, uh, I will tell you something that I don't think I've said before, but I don't know how many years ago it was, but I got, I got very ill. It wasn't specific. That was the maddening part about it. 
I just couldn't do anything. I was just feeling rotten all the time. So I went to this neurologist who gave me these tests and they do something electrical and it's really annoying. It buzzes all parts of your body. So at the end of it, she's supposed to be this celebrated neurologist from South America. She says, all I can figure out is you have anxiety. That you came in here to go through this and you tell me I have anxiety, that's ridiculous. So she just didn't know what to make of it all. So it happened that the next day, <coughs> I went to see this German doctor who can't practice in the United States. She's a woman, she lives in Bountiful, Utah. But she can do some uh, sort of naturopathic helps. <coughs> and uh, it turned out, I found out later, that Elder Robert Gay, who's had a great deal to do with this, his wife also discovered her later on and helped her a great deal. Well, what she did was uh, she helped me with my diet. And I learned that uh, certain things were really diff hard on me. And I discovered a few others after that, and I've been very true to that diet. And uh, I think that's helped me a lot. It doesn't mean I don't have aches and pains and complaints and all kinds of things, Susan will tell you, but I think I've been helped by it. Don't you, Susan? And he's been faithful on that diet during, um, during a, a unique time of my life, a time of my life when, um, when I, was, I had some personal struggles in 2010. Somehow, um, Terry and I were together for that year. I would come once a month, come to your house, and we were working on a particular project together. And I can tell you one of the secrets that I saw, and that's avocados. Avocados for breakfast, avocados for lunch, avocados for dinner, avocados on everything. And so that was, so, so I'm a huge avocado fan right now, I know that. Well, that's not the core of it. <laughs> but there's a lot of avocados, so that's great. Okay, so cut, just a couple more questions. One question was about um, your experience going out on the trail at Anasazi. <laughs> Have you been out on the trail, some of you? Yeah. Uh, well, Susan and I went out on the trail and uh, it was, uh, it was pretty miserable. <laughs> we, uh, we, we made a little wiki up of sorts. We had leaves over the top of it and so on. But we had to share one blanket between the two of us. And I would, my next sentence was going to be, guess who got the blanket, but I'm not going to say that. <laughs> but uh, we were old enough that we had to get up a few times in the middle of the night and... Uh, and we heard some animals up in the, and do uh, you have anything more to add to that, Susan? It was a long night. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't cause us to believe less in it, but we more or less believed it for somebody else. <laughs> good, 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 it's good for people, <laughs> just not us. <laughs> We did, we did live till morning, but I don't know if we slept at all. All right, we'll ask one last question, and, uh, and then Ezekiel and Pauline um, have a little uh, presentation they would like to do um, for Terry. And so um, the, the one last question would be, look, as you look at these parents in the room today, and uh, you think about their lives and the journey ahead of them and the journey that you've been on, um, just a bit of counsel. Just a bit of, from your heart, um, what would you offer them to help them walk forward in their lives? As many of them have recently come off the trail, some many years ago, but as, as they journey forward. Well, I think it's time to hear from some of them. But I used, to, I used to think that it was a little bit appalling that people who had no experience in life and were absolutely destined to mess things up at such a young age were, were the parents until I became older and realized that it gets more impossible rather than less. But I also realized that these children are so remarkable already. 
that they're what we need at the next stage. Just think about it. Anything that's really of worth in our souls has probably come from ministering to our children. 